you go. Thank you, Michelle. I know Michelle thanks a ton of people. I think we have to thank Michelle because this is the second time we've been involved, but she and her team do a fantastic job of bringing the community together. Social media does, they, there are a lot of social media marketers in Toronto, in Ontario, in Canada. I think we have to give a lot of credit to Michelle to actually bringing the community together and helping us all learn from it. Good job. So thanks for having me. It's my, uh, it's again, my second year engaging uh, with, with the group. You know, um, I'll go back a slide, actually, just introduce myself. Like Michelle said, my name is Saif Bajani. I'm one of the co-founders at Keyhole. So for those of you who don't know Keyhole, Keyhole is a Toronto-based uh, social media analytics and monitoring company. We actually have our office right kitty corner from, from here. Um, and we really help you know, hundreds of customers from around the world with brand monitoring, campaign tracking, and influencer analytics. And what I wanted to talk to you about today was really the third topic, influencer analytics, because when we work with our customers, it is one of the biggest foggy gray area that they get stumped on. And so we've learned a few things. I thought we'd take the time to, to share it here um, so that we can all be ready for what's coming next. And what's coming next in our mind, in my mind, is that influencer marketing, the way it's structured today, is a bubble ready to burst. A big correction is coming. Doesn't mean the influencer marketing industry is going to fall. It simply means the way it's structured today is going to definitely crash. And I'll talk about that, and I'll draw some parallels. So let's talk about influencer marketing today. We know that it is ridiculously expensive, unreasonably expensive, to actually hire some influencers out there, especially the celebrities. A million dollars for a post if you actually measured the ROI on some of these things, it'd be like negative. But it's not just the big ones, right? There's, micro, there's these celebrities, but then there's smaller influencers too. So it goes, it goes all the way throughout. But the industry is expected to grow. It's supposed to actually double in two years. So it's about just under five now. It should get to about 10 by 2020. Good numbers, right? A market doubling in size must be a good market. How many of you have been in the digital marketing or advertising space for the last 10 years? A few hands. Last 20 years? All right, a couple, yeah. So I, I'm, I, um, I guess I feel a lot older now. It's a young crowd. But, uh, but to next year is actually the 25th anniversary of banner ads. Banner ads, those beloved banner ads that we can't take our eyes off when we visit every website, is that, was actually created in 1994. So it's now been about 25 years. In 1996, banner ads CPMs used to be like $50 for 1,000 impressions. Today, if you're lucky, if you're a good site and a good target and all that, you'll get five. What we see is as we've seen the evolution of influencer marketing, we're seeing so many parallels with what people said about banner advertising and kind of display ads generally. Display ads continue to grow, but CPMs crashed. So what's going to happen in influencer marketing? What are the parallels? Let's take a look. So what makes influencer marketing unpredictable or unreliable? First, it's based on vanity metrics. When you look at influencer marketing today, what are the numbers people report? They'll report things like reach and views, 96% views. What does that actually even mean? Right? And how are you reporting that? And how are people reporting that to you? Most of the people we work with who've engaged with influencer marketing actually get their data from influencers themselves, or they get it from the influencer networks that they've hired. There's a little bit of an incentive misalignment there, right? Because Though they're all incentivized to give you big numbers. That's how they charge. That's how they show themselves to be very effective. So who's actually calculating the real numbers and give, giving them back? Who's actually paying attention to what the real effectiveness is versus the vanity? Second thing is based on number of followers. 2018 was the, num was the year of follower purge. We saw Twitter go through it. Facebook, like Zuckerberg, gets called by a government every other week to do something, to, to try and defend what, what they're doing in their network. Instagram's the same way. So pretty much everyone's admitted that fake follower bots are real 
and they're a problem. Right? Even the networks themselves, they've had no choice but to come out and admit that they're full of fake follower bots. So when celebrities get, celebrity followers get purged, they're losing millions of followers. And it's not just celebrities, it's, it's you know, micro-influencers, it's everybody else in between, right? The other problem is that followers can be bought. Today, if I have 1,000 followers, tomorrow I can buy 20,000 for $150. Would you pay me 20 times as much tomorrow for an influencer campaign than you would pay me today? Because that's effectively how a lot of influencers are costing themselves out, right? So there's fake follower bots, and they can be bought. Third, is they're based on popularity, not relevance. So when Microsoft came out um, with a Microsoft Surface tablet, they hired Oprah to talk about the Microsoft Surface. She did her job. She actually sent out a tweet, said how cool Surface is. She's buying a bunch of them for Christmas, sent by, from an iPad. This happens all the time. I'm picking on Microsoft. Samsung, I feel like, gets caught with this every other week. They'll launch a new phone. <laughs> Samsung's Galaxy, whatever, they'll get a celebrity, pay them a ton of money to go talk about the new Samsung phone. In daily life, paparazzi catches the same celebrities. Eh, they're on their iPhone all day, right? In a world where today you can find relevant influencers easily, it's still crazy that influencers are um, engaged based on their popularity, not on relevance. And fourth, unfortunately, some influencers can be flaky. So even if the followers are great, you hired, the, you hired an influencer. Last week, Apple's agency hired a celebrity, I am too old to know who this is, some of you may, to talk about the new iPad. Paid, them 60, 000, paid him $60,000 to send out four posts on Snapchat, I believe, so stories. He sent out two, or maybe it was Instagram. Sent out two, didn't send out the rest, pocketed the, pocketed the 60K. In the influencer kind of marketing, when you work with agencies, they call it compliance, right? How do you know that influencers you've engaged with are actually complying with the agreement? So when we work with agencies, when we work with um, brands, and marketers who are hiring influencers, there are really five pillars that we um, encourage them to look at when they're working with influencers. And these are the same five pillars I'm happy to share here. The first is, are they engaging? I'll tell you a story. Um, we have a customer based out of LA. He's an agency. They hired an influencer to target moms. So this influencer got on the program, shared the post or posts that they were hired to share, talked about it, engagement was great, everything was great. When they, when they uh, worked with Keel to try and look into the details behind this engagement, what they actually found was if you had looked historically at this influencer, this mom influencer, it turns out that her sponsored posts had higher engagement than her organic posts. So how does that happen? So dig deeper, and it turns out there was actually a network of mom influencers. When one of them got hired to work with a brand, all the others in the network basically engaged with that post. And so what's really happening is you're pumping up, you're inflating the engagement, you're inflating all these vanity metrics that people have come to you for, and they'll return the favor next time. And so they all look good when it comes to influencer marketing, but the brands and the agencies lose out. So it's not just about when you work with an, uh, with an influencer, are they driving engagement for your post? It's also about how engaging are they over the long run. If you're seeing spikes when you hire an influencer for sponsored posts, there's probably something wrong. Because even if I... Even if I'm a celebrity, when I'm shilling something, my engagement is probably going to be lower than when I'm talking to my friends. That's just human nature, right? So at the very least, it should be the same. It can't be better, right? Or it can't be spikes. Second topic is, second uh, pillar is, are they relevant? 
I said earlier, you can actually find relevant influencers way, way easier than you ever used to be able to. All it takes is you plug in keywords on social media around your brand, your industry, or even your competitors. What you'll find is here's Jane Doe, who has talked about our product or our competitor or our industry at least three times, at least five times, and when she talks about us, her engagement is at this level. So you're actually seeing that Jane isn't just a popular person, she's actually very specifically talking about this topic even when she's not paid for it. And that's where you'll actually get the highest effectiveness. The third is it's not just are they relevant, is, there, is their audience relevant? There's a, Canadian, um, there's a Canadian company, a services company, who was trying to reach uh, a Canadian audience, because they have a Canadian market, um, with, through an influencer. So they went through a search, and they actually found a great Canadian influencer. So far, it ticks all the boxes. I've got a Canadian market, I'm a Canadian company, and I want to target Canadian audience. Should be aligned, right? It turns out that looking at the audience, that audience was actually based in the US. So although the influencer was Canadian, the audience was US. So how do you figure out what the Venn diagram overlap is between your target market and the audience of that influencer? You look at, how do you look at their demographic, their audience's demographic, how do you look at the audience's location, anything else that might be a factor to you. The fourth pillar is, does the audience like them? People anchor on engagement, and rightly so, but engagement does not mean like. You don't believe me? Check US politics. Engagement is through the roof, sentiment is meh. Because you'll actually see a lot of, in, especially in social media, especially on, in public social media, um, and I kind of distinguish between where your friends can see you on Facebook versus uh, places like Twitter and Instagram. YouTube is certainly known for this. It's full of engagement from trolls, it's full of engagement from haters, it's full of engagement of a negative kind, right? So if you're only looking at the number, you're missing out. How do you actually look at not just the number, not just does it drive engagement, but does it drive positive engagement? How do you look at the sentiment of what an influencer is talking about, but also what their audience is responding with? And the final pillar that we like to talk about is do they have good momentum? When, when you look at an influencer in an influencer directory, whether it's through an influencer network, it's an influencer you just found, typically what you're seeing is a snapshot. You're seeing that, and this is, this is no fault of anybody, this is just how social networks work. It's you're seeing a snapshot of um, John has a million followers, his bio says this, et cetera, et cetera. These are the last couple of posts that he shared. What you're actually not seeing is has his account, has the influencer actually had momentum? Has, have they been talking about things consistently? Have they actually been growing an audience consistently? And have they actually been growing engagement at a proportional rate to the audience growth? Because what could happen is if you're taking just a snapshot, where, you're gonna, where you might end up is somebody with a lot of followers and a lot of historical engagement, but all the work was done last year. It's gone stale, and that happens. So, the way to measure that is you find a third-party tool. QL is one, there are others. Find a third-party tool to keep people honest. It's true about everything else we do in life. It should be true about influencer marketing. I think this our thesis is that this is what's going to cause the fall in the way influencer marketing is structured today. The way, the way influencers price themselves is a bubble. The way, and this bubble is going to get corrected, and it's going to get corrected because marketers like you and I are going to demand transparency. You're going to, we are gonna demand ROI. We're, gonna, we're going to want to know that a dollar spent is going to lead to more than a dollar back. That's how every industry is run. I think a parallel that I drew earlier is the one that holds. Look back at what banner advertising, what CPMs used to be, and they're at 10% of what they are now. So if you know that, and, our, and my projected projection is this happens by 2020. 
I think 2019 people are still riding the wave and not fully figured out how to measure from start to finish the impact of influencer marketing. But by 2020, you'll see the cost for, was it Kylie Jenner on the first slide? Her cost being $100,000, not a million dollars per post. Whether she accepts or not is up to her. But that's what, her, what, that's what an influencer like that will deserve, and everything else will scale down, because it'll come down to how effective are you in driving real returns for an organization, rather than how popular are you. So uh, I'll end there. Um, my name is Safe again, from Keyhole. My email address is there at the bottom, safe at keyhole.co. Please feel free to reach out if you have any questions, if, uh, if you need any um, details or data from what I've shared. Uh, here. Some of our team is also um, out there. Well, they're in here now, but they'll be out there later. So if you have any questions, feel, f feel free to reach out. We also have time now, I believe, uh, for questions if there are any. Yes, first row. Um, so sure. Um, oh, no. so you a lot oh, there's one here. Is this working? Okay. And I get a little frustrated because I'm, I'm on Instagram and there's very little that I can control when it comes to the success of a brand campaign. I often ask them, what do you want to get out of this campaign? What is your goal? But beyond creating the content and putting in the energy and effort into my audience, there's a lot that you can't control with Instagram. So I can have some posts that get, a post that gets 10,000 likes, or I can have a post that gets 1,500 likes. How it's hard when you're in an influencer position when the numbers are everything because you know two years on Instagram of you posting content every day, you showing up every day to get your your value reduced by the numbers um, can get a little stressful or a little annoying. So at what point does brand awareness come into play? Because you said you want to spend a dollar, get a dollar, but just like an ad campaign on the TV, you don't know whether or not that ad, unless there's a coupon or something, actually generated sales. I think, I think what, um, I think the way the digital, so I'll parallel it back to the digital ad space, you saw more and more going into performance marketing, right? Performance marketing essentially is a fancy word for if, you know, being able to measure it end to end, right? And actually being able to um, get a dollar, more than a dollar back for the dollar you put in. When I look at social networks, I see them actually helping with this, it, with the question that you have. So Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, they've all directly, YouTube too, I think, they've all f ventured into this idea of how do we actually work with influencers and work with brands to be able to measure their effectiveness. So Facebook didn't totally shy away now from awareness campaigns. They still have CPM campaigns, right? Um, so it'll just come down to the, it'll just come down to the objective of the organization. I think more organizations, just naturally, as they've done on digital in the past, are going to move towards performance. It'll, be, it'll, it'll definitely be frustrating if, um, if what you're providing is brand awareness, just like a TV ad is, or just like a billboard on a highway, right? Like, how do people actually measure the effectiveness of that, right? Um, but if that's the organization's goal, clearly people get a lot of benefits out of that. Right? Clearly, organizations find, RO, find a way to measure ROI on awareness. It'll just come down to measuring ROI even on awareness, though, I feel. Do you feel, I don't know if this is not working. Yeah, okay, Hi. better now. Um, do you feel, though, is there's almost like a systemic problem in the marketing industry or with these brands that are hiring influencers? Because there's a lot of people, especially in the Toronto area, that I, you know, people that I followed, and that, you know, 45 minutes after they post something, you're like, wow, how'd they get 2,000 likes already? And, oh, wait, these are all Brazilian TV stations, and they're buying likes, and now I'm unfollowing because this is disgusting, because as someone who's grown organically and hasn't bought, um, bought likes, that can be, it's frustrating to see someone else doing so well, but it's not true. But then I've heard, you know, just from being in the industry that there's a lot of and this is the sad part, is a lot of um, management are just saying, like, you know, when they're, when they're approached to say, by the way, that influencer you hired is purchasing likes to boost this, 
they say like, I just need the numbers. I need the numbers yeah. because I've got a boss above me that wants to see it. So you have people who are doing things the right way. But I think you'll win in the long run, right? I agree. I, I think agree. I think the boss will eventually change the question because their boss is eventually going to want to know, yeah, you got a bunch of likes, but what does that actually mean? Right. right? It's like eyeballs and banners. Yeah, you got a lot of eyeballs, but what does that actually mean? Right? So people who are essentially buying those likes are going away by 2020. And I think, I think the ones who build it organically and actually deliver measurable awareness and real engagement are the ones that survive, just like, just like the right kind of, I'm going to call it ads, but like the right media has survived 20 years later on the rest of the internet. Yes. Yeah. If you have an influencer in mind that you already are thinking, like, I might want to work with this person, can you search them by handle to get this information, or is it just hashtag? No, which would like you, you basically flip the flip the question, flip the um, flip what you analyze, right? So the way you know, if you know which influencer you want to work with. The better thing to do is actually to look at their past posts just for that one influencer and say, over the last year, for the sake of argument, how many times have they actually talked about food? And when they talk about food, how much engagement do they generate? What else do they talk about? So find a system that basically fleshes all that out for you so you're not doing it in Excel, but ultimately there should be a way to just filter up what are the typical topics that this, per that this influencer talks about words, hashtags, and how much engagement do they generally generate? And, it, and on sponsored content, how do they generate? Because that's, again, often another hashtag. That'll make it a lot easier. But, but instead of starting with a keyword, you flip it and you say, I'll start with an account. Show me everything that they've said in the last year. How do they, what do they actually talk about? And how much engagement does each topic generate? Back corner. Yeah. Hi there. Um I think you're absolutely right in terms of auditing the entire process around influencer marketing. And a lot of chief executive officers are asking the really hard questions right now. And they're identifying the amount of money that's being spent to pay for influencers, to support them with all of their asks and wants because they believe they're celebrities without any proof of performance. You know, in terms of how did this drive my bottom line? So. I, the key takeaway is, you're absolutely right, there needs to be a more foolproof auditing that's taking place. And then to address on the content side, I think that the content people that are doing a great job of building engaged real audiences, this is where they're going to have to go to the next level and connect the dots with some really strong tactics or marketing proof of performance. I think that's where it's going to go. and. It's really, really needed because it's getting ridiculous now. It Thank really you. is. Just because so-and-so's spending X, we yeah. have to. There's just so much pressure on teams to get the numbers, but they're going to go away. Thanks. Yeah, and, and, but I'll, and I'll come back to the, to the th thanks, so thanks for the comments, and I'll come back to the first um, question because influencers actually are having trouble today with the way the platforms are structured to be able to prove that performance, right? So I think that gap is actually going to close in the next year or two because it's better for social networks that influencers exist. So it'll be a way, there should be a way, or there will be a way, I suspect, for social networks helping influencers to be able to prove out their ROI. I'm gonna go back to somebody new this time. Yes. them, rather make the bosses aware of what matters and they'll start asking right questions. It's our responsibility as well. Thank you. Fourth row. Uh, I guess my question is around how do you measure um, through now that st Instagram story highlights are so huge and that's a lot of people's method of posting something that will stay on their profile, but not necessarily as a post. So how can you see what 
that engagement looks like and factor that in? So I think, um, I think there's two ways that's going to happen. One is that I do think, again, Instagram will find a way to enable brands to be able to see the impact of a specific post if that was shared by an influencer who you work with. So Facebook's enabled that a little bit, right? I think historically over the last two years, Facebook's made it a bit easier for an influencer to share the details of one specific post with a brand if that brand was tagged. Um, I suspect in Instagram is going to do the same thing. Instagram's also probably going to say it's not just about how many clicks went and how many conversions it led to, but even being able to draw um, uh, kind of correlation between somebody who saw this post, even if they didn't engage, somebody who saw this post eventually came to your site and bought something, right? I think for Instagram to be able to grow that revenue model, I think they'll be able to do that. And the fact that they're owned by Facebook, Facebook did it for posts, I suspect it's not far. Let's thank Safe for being with us today.